this, which is great. He's come, uh, we exhausted him yesterday, and we have others around the table that uh, I think we should introduce first. Here's what I think, before we do the introductions, here's what I think we should be doing. Victor, I think we agreed to look at those 10 points and the ramifications of sure. uh, intergenerational living in terms of design. I thought we would start with that. And then we'll eventually get to actually looking at, with tracing paper, you brought it, right? No? I, yes. have, I brought the one. Okay. I've got it's hard to find, stuff. wasn't it? <laughs> I should have brought the roll, but yeah, I, I thought you'd bring the roll. We can get some. Yeah, I think we probably ought to have a break and get some. Yeah, we'll right. go over there, we'll go over there and get some. And then I think we should get right down to some of the... Yes. Sorry, Dennis. You can't draw it. That's right. So, they go together. They do. So we... Be careful. So we will get down to thinking and drawing in real terms the implications and applications of those 10. Eventually, we will have joining us Pat Perry, who is the developer that we've selected, that Camps Village has selected. And he will come and he'll just mix in with us and we'll look at it. So, Victor, um, we all know who you are. Let's begin here. I'm um, John Wilkins. I'm with Gold Evans Architects. Okay. I'm David Lee, also with Gold Evans. Freddie Buchanan, PhD in Architecture and Anthropology. Gene uh, Uden, I own that. Uh, Alzheimer's facility here in Lawrence, New Bond House. Mahmoud Rashid, the School of Architecture, Design, and Planning. My name is Rod Korn uh, with ACI Bull and uh, Director of Healthcare Initiatives. I'm not an architect. I uh, was healthcare system exec at the Lake Health System for 28 years. And my role is developing business executable strategies with facility strategy. John Street, I'm an architect and planner and have a PhD. John Gott, I'm the Dean of architecture, design, and planning. I'm Susan Kemper. I'm a professor of psychology and gerontology. Dennis Domer, director of New Cities, which is where you are. <laughs> in a new city, a new kind of classroom, <laughs> and I recommend it for all professors. Uh, so you're on again, Vic. And well, we yeah. Have start. <laughs> do we have, uh, I was thinking maybe if we had a copy of these that it might be I can helpful. do that. Uh, we'll make them. Okay. Let me okay. see if I've got Extra one. Yeah, one. Good. So, I'll, good uh, I'll chase over and get some copies and be right back. Oh, keep that one sure, either one. Same. Well, um, actually, uh, these come from a conversation that David and I had a couple of weeks ago, and also we were talking a bit about the site. And uh, Dennis had said, um, We have invited you to talk about your work, so we expect uh, this presentation yesterday to be a uh, a kind of retrospective of what you know and kind of what you're thinking and all of that. But it would be really useful if there were some things that you said that had relevance to this project. So we're putting a higher <laughs> burden on you than perhaps some of the other guests that we've invited uh, because uh, we think you might be able to help us one way or the other. So, um, so I, I actually thought it, when we start talking about uh, what we conceptualized for, for yesterday was a presentation that dealt with um, housing, kind of non-institutional housing for older frail people, both um, mentally impaired as well as physically impaired. The idea of, um, of what uh, others were doing in uh, conjunction with the universities and community colleges throughout the country, just to kind of snapshot, look at other um, developments that were out there that have been uh, 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 put together and seem to be pretty successful. And, and from that, what are some of the attributes that make them successful, the attributes that are associated with the exchanges that take place between uh, the academic uh, side and, uh, and the uh, uh, housing-related side. So uh, then when we started, to, he sent me a little book, and I looked through that, read it, and, uh, and then he said, well, gee, um, maybe there's some topics that we could just talk about that might um, be relevant, and so, so not that I'm into even numbers, but <laughs> I picked, I started <laughs> uh, putting down uh, uh, topics, and I ended at ten because I, you know, ran out of time or energy or maybe both. I don't know, but these all seem to be things uh, that I thought would be useful and worthwhile in thinking about a 60-acre campus 
that uh, is oriented to, uh, to a broader age range with the idea that normalcy, if, for lack of a better way of describing it, is something that we want to underscore here so that if you drop somebody in the middle of this campus, they wouldn't go, oh, I know what this one is. This is for all the old people in town, right? So, um, so how do we, how do, we uh, do what we want to do, which is to support uh, the lives of, of uh, older people and perhaps also children as, as well and, and, and their parents? Um, while at the same time do it in a way that isn't so heavy-handed that it just kind of marks the place. So, so I started thinking about things that I thought were, were relevant and appropriate in, in, that, um, in that area. And one thing that uh, is pretty clear, I've worked on lots of projects all over the world and um, have a lot of uh, familiarity with, uh, with larger scale projects as well. And uh, so I've read many, many, many feasibility studies and uh, focus groups. I've led them, and I've also read the, the outcomes of um, survey research and, and focus groups. And one of the things that pops to the top in every survey, every survey I've ever read, that deals with this scale of development is the idea of walking pathways with destinations. And it's almost like if you don't have that, that is like the bozo no-no of the highest order. You have totally screwed up because the people who will come here uh, will, uh, first of all, want to have that kind of opportunity. Uh, they know it's good for them. They know that it's, um, it's also social. And the ones that are done really well are done in conjunction with places that people go to um, also. So, um, so I, I just talked about here. I I, I was uh, I did a I, I looked at I think it was twelve. This was back in two thousand and two. Um, active adult communities in Arizona, California, and Nevada. Uh, and I visited them, spent a day at each one of them, and just talked with people and interviewed the staff and and uh, walked the the projects and, and the models and all of that. And um, so one of the things that I noticed is that in a lot of these uh, settings, uh, if they, first of all, what they do is to create a pretty small and compact uh, a lot size. So even though you may have housing that, and a lot of it's one story, maybe 10% is two story, but, but the vast majority is one story in these active adult communities, uh, you, you, you have um, lots that uh, are are pretty small in the six to eight thousand uh, square foot range. So all of the extra square footage, line square footage, is kind of bang uh, for other purposes, for small parks, for green areas, for uh, places where you can sit and, and enjoy yourself. There is a orientation usually toward uh, the construction of a large scale exercise um, facility, which usually has exercise and, and swimming and tennis and things like that. Um, and uh, also some social piece that goes with that, and that could be uh, it could be kind of an ad hoc uh, uh, breakfast or or, or, uh, or, or luncheon uh, setting. It could be a, it could be a, a rooms that are rented for various purposes. It could be a place where activities uh, take place. So it could be a place where where there are computers and so forth. But sometimes those things are centrally located and create a kind of central node. And very frequently in these projects, kind of unusual but, and a little different, but almost all of them place a, mail, a mailing center in that, in that cluster of centralized buildings. So the people have a reason almost every day to come there, interact with one another, um, grab something uh, to drink, uh, uh, talk with their friends, uh, that sort of thing. But very frequently, things like, and I just wrote down some of them because I just thought they were, they were, they were interesting. Um, you, you could do a community garden, a, a tennis court, just one by itself, um, a, a place for uh, strength training exercise, uh, a rose garden, a dog park, a tennis, <laughs> table tennis shelter, a place to throw a frisbee, um, a putting green. I mean, we could go on and on if by describing vest pocket parks, very small um, green areas that have some purpose associated with them. If you went there, you wouldn't be just to sit there and, I don't know, smell the roses. 
maybe it would be, maybe one of them would be a rose garden, I don't know. But there would be some kind of purpose associated with it. If you didn't participate in some active way, you would watch it. It would be interesting for you to uh, pay some attention to. So uh, very frequently, um, they'll start, uh, that, that is the architect and the developer and the land planner will start with this idea of how are we going to make it really exciting and kind of interesting. So that, so that number one is the, is the walking pathway idea. The second part, which is, or the second issue here is uh, universal design, and this is something that, um, you know, we've been talking about for decades. It's been around for a long time, too, the seven points of universal design that uh, were developed by North Carolina State, goodness, in the 70s, uh, are now coming to the front where people are saying, gee, this is the way we should think about all of society. In fact, UNESCO now has this very special uh, um, project worldwide, and they've coupled with ARP here in the United States to, uh, to try and uh, transform existing cities so they're more elderly friendly. And there are eight different um, categories of interventions that they describe. It's a really interesting book you can get. PDF on the on the net and it's worthwhile looking at too because they're talking about you know Istanbul like you do Istanbul or whatever there there are countries all over the world that have really crummy infrastructure compared to what we have in the United States and the real question is how do we make uh, those cities a little bit more accessible but certainly on the on the level of the unit itself um, most people who are doing work in this area my colleague Ed Seinfeld from from uh, Sydney Buffalo is probably one of the, uh, the most renowned people doing this work. Uh, claim that it's a three to five percent, maybe seven percent, depends on how sophisticated you want to get um, additional capital uh, outlay um, in the construction of the project from the very beginning to make it, you know, pretty good. So it's visitable, which means that somebody in a wheelchair can can uh, use the restroom that's on the first floor. So that um, it's got, uh, it's possible to live on the on the first floor if it's a two-story uh, dwelling. That the quarters and the and the kitchen and the bathroom um, and the doors that connect are large enough that they can accommodate a standard wheelchair. All of that sort of stuff. Now, going into a project uh, uh, that hasn't been designed with those tolerances is very expensive and complicated, and sometimes almost impossible to do. Um, there we start talking about the size of the wheelchair. Like, let's just make it really small so people can get in and, and around because there's really not a whole lot of choice at that moment. But this idea that the universal design aspect is something that you can put in every single house and that it's got value associated with it is something that we've come to recognize. In fact, a lot of uh, builders, uh, we, we have, at, I was telling people yesterday at UC Irvine, it is past a uh, it's 10 point um, universal design uh, requirement. When I say it just passed it, it was five years ago. A lot of debate. Um, Orange County has a lot of development that takes place, a lot of residential development uh, for Southern California. And uh, there are thousands of uh, housing starts uh, that, that, that uh, uh, occur there every year. So, um, great deal of interest and concern on the part of. Uh, uh, of uh, the developers, large-scale housing developers, and Pulte and Lanier, and everybody's there. They all have something that they're, that they're developing. But the more they got into it, the more they recognized this was like, really smart. And and people, when they were told, here are the advantages and benefits of making this place uh, a little bit more accessible as you age, because a lot of them are not buying starter homes, right? They're 40-year-olds or 45-year-olds uh, that have their kids and you know, are thinking 10 years from now or 15 years from now, where are, are they going to be? Um, so when when they're told that there's a value and benefit associated with it, um, and they're they're also uh, informed that the likely buyers of their housing uh, or, or their dwelling unit uh, are likely to also value these things at more than the three to five percent that it costs them to to put it in they see it as having some intrinsic um, of value and making the house more um, it's just more um, saleable in Europe it is that way in fact um, these uh, these features in um, independent housing uh, especially rental housing in in the Netherlands they they will call a project or, or a, a senior label 
uh, project or war unit um, if it meets these uh, requirements. And uh, in Norway, um, the uh, the uh, state bank, which is the way that they're organized, uh, values those the types of units at about 10% or 15% more than the rest of the housing stock. Sort of like having, I don't know, a Spanish colonial house in Chile, right? Everybody wants that style, but there are not too many of them that were built in the 20s and 30s and early 40s. But if you buy one, uh, you pay more for it just because it's something that everybody else wants. So they found that to be the case with these senior um, uh, units that have that, that have really just uh, careful thought associated with their, with their flexibility. Um, the idea of uh, placing some emphasis on wellness when most older people are making a decision about where to move, especially if it's a, a move um, even to active adult, even if they're 55 or 60, but certainly uh, later on in life, um, the whole idea of um, where are they going to go if there's an emergency uh, problem? Um, what kind of health care system is available? Whether there are well-trained people that are going to uh, uh, be available and, and are going to uh, uh, be accessible uh, is, is always part of the sales uh, uh, job that, that takes place. You have to explain that to people, and you also have to, um, and they value it. They look at it and they go, wow, that is worth paying more for is having access to what they think of as high quality uh, medical care. So with uh, KU, it makes, you know, I mean, I don't think you could find a better label, right, a better brand uh, for, uh, uh, for, for uh, medical care than, than, uh, than the KU Medical Center in terms of what they're doing and their interest in research and the quality of the people and on and on. So, there's something there uh, that comes with the affiliation with the university and the affiliation with the medical center that also that creates an enormous halo, uh, given the values and the concerns and the interests that, that individuals have. Uh, this idea of home care delivery, and we talked a little bit about this um, uh, last night uh, when, when Pat was here, about what um, and how we can deal with the provision of help and support to people in their own homes in a more peripatetic way. That's something that I think uh, we're going to see enormous changes in U.S. society in this domain, primarily because it's just really expensive to move people into institutional housing, and I say nursing homes and assisted living, I put in that category, because special building types are expensive to build, uh, they're expensive to, to run. Um, and they aren't exactly, uh, given a lot of the regulations and given the way in which they're structured, they don't have a lot of choice associated with them. You either take it or leave it. You, know, you get a cluster of services, and that's it. Um, so, unfortunately, that's not the way people um, manage their life. Some people drive when they're 95 years old. Some people are cooking uh, their meals when they're, you know, 103. And uh, maybe you'd say, gee, I don't know about that, but uh, if you're not a social worker, Shame on you. <laughs> your business. If they can do it, so be it. And if we can figure out a way to make it possible so that they can do that and do it safely, uh, and we're not doing it, shame on us. Uh, so this whole idea of thinking about how to help people be, stay independent and do it in a more occasional or peripatetic way, rather than saying, okay, I got a good idea. Why don't we just... Uh, uh, pay somebody 15 to 20 dollars an hour to sit in your house 24 7 and charge you 18,000 a year for that person to sit there and make sure that I don't know that you're breathing or whatever it's kind of stupid and I don't think I've ever when I've, explained, when I've talked with my European colleagues about that they go you're kidding they actually do that <laughs> who are these people <laughs> you must have a lot of money I don't know how you guys do that so I mean, there's a whole world out there that's doing much higher quality care than we are and wouldn't think for a second of even tolerating that idea. So, but most of their housing with services is uh, based on this home care model and it's based on assessment of what people can do, what they can't do, how the family can help, how their friends can help, and it's that whole combination of how are we going to solve the problem, um, which is uh, worked out by a geriatric nurse, uh, 
uh, coordinator or, or uh, maybe a social worker who's especially trained in this area that is the basis for, uh, for that. Okay, so the fifth one here is dementia care. And we, we're going to see amazing things happen in, in the next 20 years. In fact, it's kind of scary. Um, it, it, if you just think back what's happened in the last 10 years, it's scary. Um, but we're going to, certainly we're going to have, uh, we're going to have medications that are custom fitted to DNA. That's going to happen in three to five years. We're certainly going to have a cure to cancer. We now already have, there are five or six cancers that we have these uh, special kind of uh, nanoscience uh, uh, solutions for. And they, they give you an a inoculation and these cell-sized uh, um, uh, uh, molecules uh, find the cancer cells, they kill them in certain cancers, and uh, instead of chemotherapy wiping out half of your system, uh, they, they, you know, they're attracted to cancer cells because cancer cells are, you know, they're greedy and they want a lot of food, and, and that's part of the problem. They take over your body. So we know enough about all of that to, to be right on the edge of figuring out how we're going to solve that. When that happens, we're going to see a jump in lifespan. We're also probably going to figure out um, how to deal with aging. I, I mean, how to to deal with the basic uh, the, the basic um, uh, physiological issues that are associated with um, with aging. Or I know somebody that is. So um, all that's going to happen, and it's going to cost us a kajillion dollars, and we don't really even know what we're going to do with it. We're certainly not prepared to deal with it. Um, there's enough technology out there that we can we can anticipate it and fix it, but we can't pay for it. So um, that's something we're really good at. We're good at the science part. We're not so good at being able to spread that uh, throughout society. But all of that good stuff that's going to happen uh, is not going to happen to mention. We just so far have run up against a brick wall every time we've tried to figure out how to deal with that uh, with that problem. And every time we come up with a medication, it, it either screws up your liver or, or destroys your brain or, you know, there are enormously negative side effects associated with it. And we pretty much know, based on the testing that's taking place, uh, the FDA testing, um, five to seven years in advance what's out there that's being tested and what's being tested in other countries. And there's nothing on the horizon that really looks that promising. So we're probably stuck with dementia for a while. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just a really quick one, I think. How, is there any significant difference in the percentage, in a percentage of dementia between the United States and, say, Scandinavia? No, not really. It's all yeah. pretty, pretty consistent. Yeah, it really is. I mean, there, and no, there's so many theories about onset that, you know, and they're all very individual, and of course everybody who has dementia, he'll tell you, <laughs> is different, <laughs> because it affects your brain in very different ways. So it's a quite complex uh, disease, both to diagnose and to treat, but also to care for, because the individuals have different kind of behavioral responses to it and, and whatever. It's a very, very problematic uh, uh, disease. And we do know that, um, you know, almost half of people over the age of 85 have what we call MCI, which is mild cognitive impairment, or some other form of uh, dementia that is, uh, is materializing in their body and is probably going to uh, become something that will disable them sooner or later. So um, there really isn't much uh, you can do about it. Uh, if we have people who are going to live longer, then the percentage of individuals and the number of people with dementia is going to increase as well. And that's part of the reason we have a lot of people nowadays that have those problems, just we're living longer than we used to in the, in the past. Um, the idea of the greenhouse, uh, which is number six here, which are our small scale uh, clusters of um, kind of family clusters are, are not only popular here, but they've been popular in Europe for about 30 years. We're starting to figure it out here. It just seems like a good idea. But I, I remember seeing buildings in 1990 that were set up almost identically to the way the, uh, the kind of greenhouse or small house model was set up here in the United States. So this idea that if we, if we uh, create uh, a smaller cluster that's more family-centered, uh, that tends to be less clinical and tends to be more uh, normal. Um, that not only do people like that lifestyle, 
but but it seems to uh, to attract families. It, 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 the literature that's out there is not really great, and some of it's conflicting at this moment. Uh, but the literature will tell you that there's something going on here that's really good, and and it has uh, a lot to do with the scale of the intervention. So. Uh, this idea of uh, not building 40 units of dementia or not building 60 units of skilled nursing and having everybody take a meal in a big room um, is really just not as good as, um, uh, you know, it's not really the perfect solution. So if we can start to think about how to make it smaller and reducing the scale, and also there's some kind of development advantages to that as well. because. If you're, if you're building these things in increments of 10 or 12, um, you don't have to build 40. You can build 10 or 20 or 30. You can sort of add on uh, to those. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess we can ask questions here as we sure, go along. Sure, of course. Um, one of the issues always is, uh, what's the tolerance of the so-called normal population for these kinds of uh, units uh, that are uh, decentralized right. and scattered? Here's an example. I went to uh, Bridge Haven the other day, which is one of your competitors, mm -hmm. but you have yeah. plenty of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> and I asked her, well, how's the neighborhood? It's a neighborhood right here west of town, or west of the university. Uh, small, modern, uh, uh, suburban design, mostly. And I said, well, how are your neighbors handling it? She said, everybody is fine except for the one just north of us. And while nothing has ever happened, she has been against it, and she, she said, this administrator said, we had a party here, and she mooned us. <laughs> she's, a, she's a lawyer. No, she's, she's a lawyer. Well, okay, maybe so she's I guess you could expect it, right? I don't know. But, but, but nevertheless, I mean, so how do we deal with that, and is that, do people get finally get used to it? You know about this uh, to a lesser extent, but isn't that a problem? Well, it's, yeah, it's called ageism, and I yeah, don't know. Right. It's a pretty big thing. It's a big and thing, yeah. I, I think it's people have to future. be people have to be more tolerant. Yeah, can you um, believe that? We Somebody can, who's a fifty-year-old woman would moon uh, a party. Yeah. Well, <laughs> she feels that strongly, to be quite honest. <laughs> she'll get it. She'll get it. Yes. Who knows? But 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 we do know a lot. We and especially um, uh, decentralized uh, housing for developmentally disabled or halfway houses actually for uh, for youth um, who've been in, uh, incarcerated. We know a lot about the impact of these small group arrangements on housing values and uh, on other neighborhoods. And it's pretty inconsequential, to be quite honest. There are some good studies that have been done. ULI actually has has. Um, Analyzed uh, this and, and published um, uh, uh, good data on on the economic impacts of these settings. So um, I think we're always going to have people who um, who have problems. But the best way to to fix it is to I think involve people. I know that's uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what you guys do from a process perspective, but I know in a lot of developers I work with, the first thing they start with uh, is, a, is a trip around the neighborhood to talk to all the abutters and say, this is what we're going to do, and this is what we have in mind, and this is what the building is like, and um, do you have any problems? Um, uh, are there issues uh, in terms of uh, uh, visual impact or uh, whatever? Just tell us what it is, because we'd like to know. So first of all, you want to hear it, and second of all, you want to be able to mitigate it if, if at all possible. So, if, you know, 27 trees, uh, double handling of trees fixes it. That's a cheap solution uh, for an abutter that could show up at a meeting and say oh, horrible things. So I, I think the best way to manage it is just to communicate with people, and if they see you as a human being, it's pretty hard to hate you. It really is. It's just, you know, take a... Uh, a page out of the playbook for uh, racism and the same kind of thing. If people see you as a as an individual and not as a as a group or as a class, it, it, it's a different um, it, it's a different kind of interaction. So I think getting to know people, you know, listening to them, um, hearing what they have to say, uh, uh, feeling both empathetic toward it. Sometimes um, it, it's useful, you know, these guys know, uh, you get some people who really are obnoxious and strange, but explaining to them that, well, you know, this piece of land is, uh, is zoned in a certain way, so we're going to put housing there where no one's going to really drive, and uh, it's pretty benign, 
but the Kmart could go in there too, by the way. Uh, and maybe they have lawyers that, that know how to argue this a little bit more effectively with this surround. So there are many different tools that you can use in the toolbox. It doesn't always have to be so social work empathy. But I think if you start with listening to people and understanding what their point of view is and perspective, is very helpful. Would you have any comment to that? Because you have uh, one of those uh, decentralized uh, yeah, um, memory care. Actually, one of the one of the uh, uh, slides that you pulled up yesterday is, is similar in design. We have another another building going. We currently have 14 uh, units, and actually, we're designing. Uh, the building's going to be a little bit larger. We're putting lifts in the ceilings. The doors, instead of three feet, are going to be three six. Uh, you know, just make it as barrier free as we can. Uh, you know, kind of an open uh, kitchen type facility. You know, the hardest part with uh, a lot of the folks are, uh, you know, the activities. We try to keep them as busy as we can, but at the end of the day, some people just don't don't like that. You know, I mean, they kind of withdraw. Um, you know, in some of these other facilities, I think. Uh, you know, management is probably every bit as important as the yeah. building structure. Oh, clearly. And More we, important to be yeah. quite honest. You know, you have to um, uh, have uh, uh, you know, management in place that will take the time right. for, you know, individual care or, or whatever to keep try to keep people involved. Right. And your so neighbors, no problem no with problems, that? No problems, no. Okay, go ahead. No. Well, I think uh, it also if you can, you were talking about the interior and mm -hmm. just how you've tried to make it more comfortable and, mm -hmm. and, and attractive for families and for mm -hmm. residents. But, but if you take the perspective, uh, literally, the curbside perspective of your neighbors and you think about, oh, mm -hmm. what can I do here mm -hmm. in terms of the palette of materials or colors or, mm -hmm. or plant materials or whatever it might be, there are lots of ways to make the building far more attractive from the outside as well. And mm -hmm. those are, those are you know, well-placed uh, expenditures, I think. Mm -hmm. Much cheaper than hiring a lawyer to fight it all. Mm -hmm. Can I just interrupt? Yeah. How large is this new one? How many? It's 14 units, units about a oh, 14,000 square foot building. Is it, is it all dimension care? Yeah. It's killer. Dimension. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the reason you went with a little large one, here's what I've been told by mm -hmm. other people, is that at some point in time to keep rents to the, or the cost to the resident from the, the market to support, they need right. to get more efficiency with the labor mm -hmm. and the operational mm -hmm. cost structure. And so the way you do that is make it a little bit larger, a little bit larger, and then mm -hmm. economics well, get it to be one of these small buildings again. And, yeah goes back away from the house right. on Well, the, the second building that we're, we're building, I, I think our, our goal is maybe to, to take care of a, uh, more of a physically disabled you know, individual too. That's why the, the lifts in the ceiling to kind of help the staffing and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it's just a little, little different. Uh, but this uh, economy of scale argument mm -hmm. is made by a lot of people. And, uh, in the, the difference between small house and green house is really uh, based on the uh, patent uh, that, or the intellectual property that provides the foundation for that. And uh, and they have a certain number that they think it has to be. It's got to be 12. Can't be any more than that. Can't be any less than that in order to meet the economy of scale kind of requirement. But you know the, the thing that you don't think about is that there, if you have a very a collection of people there, some people take twice as much help and support that as other people do and you have to think about how you charge for that but generally um, I think one of the best ways to do that is to have people pay for whatever they whatever they they take and whatever they need so uh, so there is a way to think about that from the standpoint of how the economies of scale um, operate and whether or not you need uh, how many people you need but uh, I, I don't think that making it bigger is necessarily uh, better economically. I think what often happens, uh, if, you've got, if you've got a whole collection of, of, um, of places and people can move in, you're, you're not going to turn anyone away. So some people think, oh gee, I want to hit uh, that 100% occupancy level and I've got to have 30 people in order to meet a kind of uh, uh, pre-established performa. And, and I think if you figure it with two units or Three units, even some people would argue, in, in some contexts, it's easy to do that. Easier to do that. 
um, it's it's all a question of just uh, creating the right uh, uh, the right approach and a lot of the the caregiving at a higher level that is the, the nurses and and, um, and if, if doctors are there uh, doing diagnosis it's all going to be uh, occasional it's not going to be somebody sitting there as a director of nursing behind the desk someplace it's all all going to be much more uh, virtual <laughs> they're going to be going from one place to another and that's how it works in Europe and it's how it works in a lot of other and in many of the greenhouse um, Establishments uh, as well. Okay. Well, I was just going to add in when we talked with Joey with the commissioner for the Department of Aging here. You know, they've got the Home Plus program uh, that basically limits a uh, facility to 12 residents. They said the ones that are successful usually have a owner um, in residence that's a car in. And the, the 24 7 assistance is a certified medication. Fire, it's not right. part of them, so. Right, right. Uh, but the fees are pretty comparable to a SNF facility. I don't know yeah. what the reimbursement percentage looks like in a home plus facility versus a SNF facility. I think it's a fraction of what you might get in a SNF, but I think that's something we want to bet out with right. the um, state. Yeah, the, um, these apartments for life that I was talking about yesterday are really not based on a care model, and they're even though you do have people who can't stay there for a much longer uh, period of time, uh, there are 10 people or five people, six people for every 10 people that are in the building that are in really great uh, shape uh, physically. So uh, it'll tolerate uh, the support for, for that group, uh, but it's not meant to be something that is uh, uh, long-term uh, either. Uh, so um, just to end this, uh, there, there are four or five left here. This idea of uh, volunteerism and self-help is something that I think is really important. Um, being able to, to train uh, providers, invite family members, uh, encourage volunteers to be a part of the, uh, the collection of, uh, and again, when you're at a university, you've got just a broader array of people who uh, are available. You have some people who are, who are actively involved in internships, you have uh, individuals that uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, would be more uh, predisposed toward volunteering. Uh, it's, a, it's a better um, kind of mix or connection uh, to um, a larger universe of individuals that are predisposed to, to think about um, helping in, in, in that way. Um, number eight is the emphasis on exercise, uh, sports facilities, and the social lifestyle amenities. We talked a little bit about that. Certainly it's part of this uh, um, formula for 55 plus, but, but I would think in general, if you go to most um, continuing care retirement communities today, there is a strong emphasis on wellness, or what they would call wellness, and that is uh, both the psychological and physical and uh, operational and, 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 and in every other way you can possibly conceive it. So, so this notion that, that you should be in a setting that reduces stress, you, you should be in a setting that encourages social exchange and, and social connectedness um, in, a, in a setting where you can get advanced uh, diagnosis of any uh, problem uh, early, um, a place where you can, you can exercise and you can have colleagues to exercise with or, or to spend your life with. Um, all of these things are really important and, and they're what make these particular um, places compelling for a broad range of people. I, um, I had uh, a really good colleague at, at Pulte, Del Webb, who um, w was always saying, well, you, you guys that are involved in care housing um, have it easy because people have to come to your buildings. Right? They have no choice. Um, but he said, when we build uh, an active adult community, we don't arrest people and bring them in. <laughs> they have to come on their own. They have to see that there's a value here that they're missing in their life and that we have the answer to that. Uh, and we have a setting that makes their life more fulfilling, happier, um, uh, much more uh, enjoyable and pleasure-filled. So he said, that's really what we do. We try and make people happy. We try and make the setting a compelling one that, that and so we're not out trying to recruit people, we're just trying to explain to people what we do and we let what we do um, convince 
those who are coming in that it's either a good idea or a not so good idea for them. If you go to the to the Pulte Dell web, uh, website, you can do a really interesting thing. They have a survey you can take, which is like, I don't know, 30 questions or 35 questions. And um, of course, they've, they've been looking at people who um, are well uh, suited for this lifestyle for you know, 35, 40 years. But you can take these sur this survey, and at the end of it, it can tell you whether or not you're likely to enjoy this kind of setting or not. <laughs> It's very interesting. It's very clever. Yeah, it is very clever, and it's actually quite good because they don't really want people to waste their time um, if it's not for them, right? So, so you can even just see. Well, am I more on the social side, or am I more on the individual side? Do I do I really um, uh, value autonomy over social connectedness? And if so, this is a way for you to at least use a free well uh, developed and accurate instrument. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think this is really interesting because, um, you know, the, this baby boomer population is gigantic and diverse. Right. And the most you can hope to do is to appeal to a niche of, for a lifestyle that they're looking for. Right. And we can't do, we can't build this for everyone. Uh, and so, right. no, I think exactly that if right. people don't want universal design, for example, for whatever reason, well, they should probably go someplace where they don't have to have it. Rather than to say, well, we don't want you to build our house that way. Uh, they should go just next door to the house because I think that if we do this right, we will, it will speak for itself. Right. And, and I mean, what you have to, what you really have to deal with is ignorance. <laughs> That's yeah. the problem. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of people have, form an opinion based on really not understanding. Um, yeah. What if, oh, universal science sounds horrible. Sounds like it's going to be institutional. Well. You can walk through a house that is built uh, to, an, to a uh, design standard that has a universal design platform and not know the difference. That's right. If you I do it right, you will not see it. To, mm -hmm. to uh, tell me, oh, this is what I don't like about it. <laughs> so it's very interesting. If, if, you, if you can show people that, yeah, it's got a lot of benefits and it doesn't really cost a whole bunch, and you can sell, uh, resell it uh, uh, slightly easier uh, than, than you might otherwise. It, it makes a kind of a good compelling case uh, that this uh, is not the stupidest thing that, uh, that they could do. Question in your, your uh -huh. in evaluations, what role, if any, were the acute care providers playing in the, the, these communities? Um, it, well, they don't have many active LPR. Are you talking about in, in the in just like an apartment complex that has services? Mm -hmm. Like the, the ones that in uh, Scandinavia you were getting Right, today. right. So as to bring people here, because this is a special place, there should be a um, health satellite somewhere, and there should be significant space for uh, KU's living laboratory. And let's say, just for fun of it, I don't know how much that is, John, what would you say? 10,000 square feet, would you say? That's what I've come up with. That's what, the, okay, <laughs> Susan Kemper, distinguished <laughs> professor of psychology, hey. 10,000 square that. feet. Okay, uh, the university I space, should it, be, should it be concentrated? Should it be uh, decentralized? And remember, there will be lots of research going on here, and there will be community-based nursing, home care delivery, whatever the new delivery system should be, we should look to that future, what's gonna happen here and in the next 15 years, rather than what's happened in the last 25 years. We can build off of that, but that's your assignment. How about that, John? <laughs> Do you want to begin? No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> no, I, no it, 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 it's really interesting. Uh, Victor, coming back to the images you were showing us yesterday, I mean, it, to be fair about this, this is just taking a shot at putting stuff on the site. <coughs> it, it's, it, it's absurd to criticize it, but it does point out that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave shortly, but a couple of things I'd just like to mention. What it doesn't have, it's texture, right? Mm -hmm. And everything you were showing us had that. Right. The the, the uh, pedestrian, not entirely pedestrian, but I assume mm -hmm. the pedestrian uh, walkway uh, with gardens, and, and you're walking through this really lovely frontage on both sides. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, this doesn't show up in this kind of. It's very formalized. Right. Um, <coughs> because I have to get away. I want to mention this. You know, coming back to the. Uh, universal design. 
Um, in an ideal world, everything would be done that way, whether it was in a, a place like this or not, right? And, and uh, but if, if, for example, this as a first phase was was not done with universal design at that five, roughly five percent mm -hmm. uh, premium you're talking about, that it seems that would seem to be create a sort of odd line here. Um, and it, but I realize, I mean, there are economics involved. Uh, uh, there is a developer working to do this in the short run and so on. I, ju I just hope that that can be kept in mind. It must be somehow this, this connection needs to be more imperceptible. Uh, and there's, there's such great opportunity here to do that. But if this, if this sort of greenway had these and you know there there are trees shown, but I mean right. a, a more deliberate kind of texture to it. If that greenway sort of extended in here and, and really spread, um, it would make such a difference. I, I think you're right. I think the way I would approach this is to start with my number one category, which is this: you know, yes. where are you going to walk? Uh, yeah. What are the great places to walk yes. here? Where are the great, um, yeah. uh, terrific places to overview uh, the city? Um, you want to be working. Well, I like the way you started there because that, I mean, <laughs> you have others can work. To start yeah. Anybody right. can work here and who's capable of working. But yeah. that Dennis always wants us to just draw this thing. Right. 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 Well, when you do something tangible, it also stops everyone else from thinking in creative ways as well. well but if you just sort of say, you got this in, okay, and that's not going away. Right. Um, and when I look at this, having driven down there this morning as well, I, and talking to David, we've talked a little bit about the idea of setting back uh, housing so that it's uh, much more intimate with the front uh, edge. And that, that, that example that you, um, that you like uh, so much is exactly that way. Uh, it, there is such an intimate kind of connection between the front edge and the small little front porches. And uh, the place where people are walking, that setback is so narrow that you can't help but walk down that uh, walkway and see people and smile and uh, and some of them have little fences and, uh, and hedges or whatever in order to create the appropriate kind of level of privacy but yet they're very connected so if you think about how something like this can have the opportunity to connect people together and then if there w if this thing was bigger or maybe it's okay the way it is maybe we don't have any choice we have to have it the way it is and that there's a centerpiece uh, to this that is more shared Let's just assume that it's kind of like this, right? And that each of these units have a very hard edge on this side, which is very intimate and connected to the street. I lived in the Hollywood Hills for 20 years, where the Hollywood sign is. <laughs> so, uh, all built in the 1920s, the streets are 18 feet wide, you know, really narrow. And you cannot walk those streets without getting to know your neighbors. I mean, it's like impossible, especially if you have a dog that barks. Uh, everyone knows one another because of the intimacy between the edge of the house and the, and, and what is uh, both a, a street that people drive on and, and people walk on. And if we could assume that that might be the case, and not saying that everyone here, you know, gets to share this sort of centerpiece, but m maybe a third or, or maybe a quarter. Um, we, we try out a new idea, and the idea is that this, uh, and it's not even that radical of an idea, it's been tried a lot of places, uh, uh, but the idea is that we, we create a more collective uh, common, where people can interact with one another, and, and maybe there are some tot lots here for, um, for different age uh, children, and, it, and it's possible to sit and watch, or it's possible to come and bring your grandchild if you want uh, them to play uh, here. Um, and maybe there's an allotment garden here, and maybe there, who knows? I mean, a lot of things that we could invent that would be part of this interstitial space that would have benefits to others and would be kind of a physical manifestation of this co-housing, right? We can all share this big backyard. And as a result of that, we gain the benefit of this. And, and maybe we do cool things, like uh, plant some really beautiful trees here than in another five, and not just plant the little twiggy ones that are about an inch in diameter, but maybe a 36 inch box tree that 10 years from now is gonna be really good size. Uh, and maybe that's a po kind of a pocket park idea, yeah. so you might yeah. want to. And, and then of course we want to connect, the, like the, there's something mm -hmm. here which looks like a drainage ditch, but uh, and it probably is something like that, or a drainage right away. 
but we also want to connect it with this and we want to connect it with this as well so I think if you sat down and you thought oh, how are we going to get the housing here how can we create this kind of special <coughs> shared situation by pushing the housing as close as we can to the uh, 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 to the property line on on one side and how can that be part of a broader uh, bigger uh, park area that links everything together it's kind of a good place to start and we aren't saying okay first thing we do is bring the bulldozer in and all of those you know freshly uh, poured uh, <laughs> sidewalks and streets uh, uh, we demo to start with uh, so I, I do think that's part of the problem here is that you're stuck with something that um, that has a kind of uh, has a kind of conventional layout to it that you, you need to, uh, to to operate on but when I look at something like this I think in, in David's first scheme too he he talked about the idea of this being a really good connector and and the lake itself and maybe even the centroid but when I was driving here I was a I was uh, this morning. I was surprised by the yep. size of these streets. I mean, they're yep. really quite substantial. So, to have something that's shared, that is the centroid of the project and is equal distance uh, from from all of the other uses, probably not a bad idea. So, it feels so, like a long walk across that side. Mm -hmm. So, right. That's why that began to seem important. Right. So, I think to start with, what is it, and how does it, you know. What direction does it go? And it, maybe it's a collection of three or four buildings that are connected to the landscape, not one big gigantic building. Um, I, I love the work of Frank Gehry in our part of the world because uh, what he introduced to us was the village of parks, right? So <coughs> we did a, a senior center uh, about five years ago uh, where we said, okay, we're going to just make this. This has got five, uh, five rooms. We're going to make five buildings out of it. And uh, we're going to have uh, the the interconnections between uh, the buildings serve as this this uh, kind of connective tissue landscape and uh, because in our part of the world you can live outside and sleep outside and you know be outside most of the time not as much of a problem it just made a lot of sense for us to do that so who knows but you might be able to even on a on, on days like today have covered walkways and connections that would allow that kind of indoor outdoor uh, relationship to evolve so that it's not one big Kind of gigantic institutional building that's 422 feet long and you know 82 and if feet wide. There was wide. a prevailing attitude that would suggest that any path you take would be a pleasant path. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. So you're and not you're paths. not wearing paths that are your favorite. Not mm -hmm. that there wouldn't be favorites. We all have that. But I mean, right. there there are no bad paths. That's exactly it's right. It's a walkable, humane place. Yeah, and each one may be different because you've got different views, oh, yeah. or you yeah. have a different yeah. uh, collection of trees. Different. This has a great raking move. It, it you does. Know, from, this yeah. is very high, and that's relatively low. And, that's a tremendous opportunity. And, and that's why I was saying here in some of these, if we could just say, OK, uh, where do the top lots go, and where are the dog runs going to be, and where are the, these are not things that are terribly complicated to do, but yet um, uh, could be uh, created in certain settings. Um, but I think if you did that and started thinking about where some of those might be located, and then start operating on on the uh, uh, on the kind of physical uh, spaces that are available, I think you can you can invent some pretty interesting. I mean, maybe you wouldn't get uh, what is it three, six, nine, you know, eighteen units over here. Maybe you wouldn't get eighteen units. Maybe you get fifteen or whatever. I don't know. But maybe that would, and maybe, and maybe see, this would be more dense in other places. The, the city wants fact, it to be denser, good. okay, and so does the developer. Yeah. And they're all looking for it to be denser. So I right. think you have to think beyond this right. um, individual and, and, plotting. And thing. Looking at these, of course, they're individual plots. I mean, I don't know how you resolve that. But so much of what we were looking at in, right. in Scandinavia was this interconnectedness of elements. That right. they, they connect by gardens. They connect by walkways, the porches. I mean, yeah. everything is working this way, right. and and it really has a sense of of this interaction, this community, and you know, rather than separate. Right. Things. Now there's you're, a, there's you're a built-in exactly right. tough thing to cope with here, and that is where you create the shared space that you drew, Victor, and and you move toward the street. It's where where the cars go mm -hmm. and the frontage of garages that mm -hmm. you don't want. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, you've got to sort that out. But there's a push and pull on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm sure there are many examples that have solved that problem. Yeah. 
Well, I, I think, um, yeah, most of the ones that I'm familiar with in, in uh, Northern Europe, especially those that are oriented to a slightly younger um, age group with a lot of people that drive, um, there isn't really a, um, I, I don't think there's a, an obsession on garages, it's more carports and shelters. Um, as opposed to something that you know has a big door uh, associated with. But even if you have that, I mean, there's sometimes ways to lessen the scale of that uh, of that kind of. But you're right. If you go to many of the active adult communities, um, it's one garage door, double garage door after another. And I think there needs to be a way to mitigate it and think about it and um, recognize that that that's a problem that needs to somehow be attended to. You did that very nicely, I thought, with those that casita idea up mm -hmm. front, mm -hmm. right? And then a kind of uh, U shaped. You might draw that out someplace, yeah, because we just, it, we just it, you still one. have the garage, but it doesn't look like that. Yeah, we looked at one plan that was kind of like this, actually, like with a casita that was over in there. Um, where, and, and then maybe this kind of deal. Um, where where maybe this is the two-car garage. This could be um, a, second, a third garage. If you were pulling into it here, you could pull into it here as well. Or it could be um, part of the courtyard and an independent 200 to 300 square foot uh, space that could be a hobby space, it could be an office, it could be a, a dwelling unit for, uh, for a student, it could be a caregiver um, um, a bedroom, it could be a lots of different things. This is one of the more popular um, options that uh, Pulte Del De Webb has uh, constructed in their, in, in, in their project in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas, uh, which a lot of people take, and they, and they take this, uh, it's very interesting. This, I think, costs an additional $30,000 to build, and they will, uh, they will set it up for $5,000 so that you've got all of the utilities run to it. And then you're holding the permit for it, and the permit doesn't have an expiration date. They figured out how to engineer it. It's Las Vegas, by the way. <laughs> so if you want to, five years from now, if you think, oh, now I can afford it, and I'll refinance the house and build it, or I'm getting a little bit older, and or my mother is now looking for a place to stay, and I really want to have her nearby, and, and this would be a perfect option for it, you can explore that later on. So, And in the meantime, it's, you know, it's a nice... Uh, um, area that can be planted, it can be a patio space in the front, it can be a, kind of a front yard, which is one of the things that you often miss in those settings that are, are packed on the side. I do have something to add to this. Um, when I was working out in California, I was doing defect mitigation work, and I didn't know until yesterday that Pulte and Del Webb, because I worked on those tracks, I've mm -hmm. seen these go up. Mm -hmm. I, but they were next to Deer Horton, Turner, Shea, all these other developments. Right. So I think that's why I didn't connect that they were for an aged homeowner. Right. They look like everything else that was being developed in the Musqueam community. Well, I had no idea it was yeah. something separate. Well, these uh, have become more popular uh, lately because of this multi-generational mm -hmm. interest. Uh, the boomerang kids and all of that. Gee, we're, are we going to put the, uh, the son or daughter who can't, uh, who's finished college and now is not going to live independently? So there are enough people now that are coming back, and and people are thinking, gee, I don't mind my mother-in-law as long. Yeah, that's, I always heard it be room. called the in-law suite. <laughs> so, so there, I think there are multiple uh, purposes associated with it that have high utility for people. It's like having a little, uh, having a little space that you can go to. For some, it would be a man cave that they would hang out in, I guess, with all their uh, toys. Call it what you will. Right, exactly. So it's a place where you can uh, you can have a little bit more privacy. Have you seen those that are the two stories or the one and a half with the loft? Uh, yeah, they're. Uh, I mean, they're not quite as common. Uh, what, what, what you'll see with uh, with uh, uh, some of the active adult communities is maybe ten percent. Maybe 10 or 15 percent would have this, but another uh, 10 to 15 percent. Thank you, John. We'll, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Sorry, it's great. Duties, you no, understand. really, really appreciate. It. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this. Uh, 
Yeah, the, the idea of second story, uh, uh, generally you'll have a first floor um, uh, uh, master bedroom, so it's possible to look down there, but, but then uh, maybe you have upper floors where there are other discretionary uh, spaces, uh, activity spaces, or separate bedrooms for kids. I've seen them turn into like dance studios or you know, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, they're not as, they don't have as much utility because a lot of older people that are moving to an active adult community are moving from two-story stock start with. So their, one of their motivation is, I'm going to get out of this two-story house into something that really works for me a little bit more effectively because I'm worried about taking the, the stairs or falling or whatever it might be. I was talking about just that granny flat, just that one one building right. being two stories. So for example, a branch of the speech and hearing clinic and the augmentative communications group um, and the uh, audiologists. Uh, so we need to do a much better job of training students uh, not only to assess hearing loss but to help uh, uh, older adults who have uh, communication challenges as well as kids with communication challenges. So it's sort of satellite audiology clinic. That's very expensive and very dedicated space to put in sound booths and that, that sort of thing. Um, a similar kind of need are for people in health psychology. It's a big rooming area. We have grossly inadequate space on campus. But I'm, uh, we have colleagues that are interested in things like a sleep lab. Um, um, not just for uh, uh, obese uh, older adults with sleep apnea, but for uh, middle-aged people and, and young adults with depression, uh, fibromyalgia, and other conditions that result in sleep uh, disorders. But to train our students to work to assess uh, people with uh, sleep disorders in a community-based uh, setting. Um, again, very dedicated, very special needs kinds of, of spaces. Um, uh, an exercise science uh, cluster that might be developed in conjunction with whatever the hospital might be doing and whatever rehab programs in OT and PT might be interested in, but our people in exercise science, we have an enormously important resource at the Alzheimer's Center in, the, in our medical school with a, a very innovative program on exercise as a possible preventative for dementia. They're working with not Salvation Army units, but no, they have clusters of exercise programs all throughout Kansas City. They dearly love to have an exercise cluster here and an outreach center here to expand their programming. But there's no space available for the neurologist to come out and do assessments and the psychologist to come out and do work with intervention. So an act, sort of an exercise science suite right. that might be coupled with all the treadmills and that kind of thing. See, that's a really, um, if, if you look at like the ones I was showing yesterday that are tied, the ones at right. Harvard. Yes, uh, it's the. If it's, you, if you go to that exercise room, you find all of these clinical suites as well. It's a, so you have, have the treadmills in the middle of the, the clinical suites with the metabolic parts uh, in them so people can assess the impact of the exercise right, on the right. uh, individual. And that's certainly that's again to the community very too. dedicated uh, space, uh, sure. very pricey space. Um, I, I, mean, I, I have grandiose plans. I'd like to build a driving simulator. We have people in psychology and people in the School of Engineering very much interested in transportation issues and transportation safety mm -hmm. issues. A real driving simulator, not some little rump thing that sits on a desk with a, a large computer monitor, but a real driving simulator. But what's interesting about that is that they just need a space to plug it in. It's yeah, very they, simple they, once you get it in there. It's yeah. just a plug in. Yes. You buy it. That's all it is. Yeah. And they yeah. can commercialize it. There's but commercial I mean, applications. But again, it would enable us to expand our undergraduate labs, our undergraduate training programs and also our graduate training programs and research faculty. And wouldn't it be lovely to have the sleep lab next to the driver's simulator so the researcher who figures out how to intervene to improve sleep patterns for middle-aged adults can show that they are then at less risk for having traffic accidents. And wouldn't that be a lovely possibility? But right now, the sleep people are working in Kansas City and the driver's simulator such that we have is on the fifth floor of Fraser Hall, and not the two are never going to get together. Right. 
Um, so you know, to add to that, the one on the acute care side, one of the gross areas beyond sleep is coming into, and we're doing a couple of them, is neuroscience. Oh, sure, uh, sure. Institutes. These yeah. things are, and they're right. similar testing centers. That's right. They can do multiple right. purposes in these That's things. That's right. right. I mean, they're really so, so I see this sort of a health psychology suite that would bridge between the exercise science people, the driver simulator, and then I'm out there, I want to move my eye tracker lab out there, and, and suddenly we will find people in the business school who are interested in doing marketing research and eye tracking studies with the residents of this uh, village, right? Um, so I, I had, but there may be other units as well. I, I kind of have a proposal and a set of ideas that's a part of the village um, board uh, vision, but uh, it's, it's sort of mixed use from these kinds of very dedicated to the very flexible use and sort of in between would be needs for uh, what I call consulting space for people in social welfare, people <coughs> in clinical psychology, um, uh, pharmacy practice, uh, the elder law clinic to meet with clients uh, to provide uh, advice and guidance on sort of navigating healthcare options, navigating uh, legal systems, um, uh, uh, that, that kind of thing. Um, so these kinds of uh, shared clinical space, which is just you know, little rooms with uh, um, soundproofing, good soundproofing. So are there going to be some conflicts of interest in what they're doing at the Landon Center and, and KCK and what? You're interested well, in to this campus. Uh, I think they're what the what I know that they're they're doing is, is that everybody needs more space and more expansion. So uh, I don't see the conflict so much as uh, trying to sort of prioritize uh, a need. So I, I do think there's some expansion going on uh, there in through nursing and OT and, and PT and, and other areas. But I, I don't see that as being in conflict. It just may be a prioritization issue. I, I personally believe, and I'm a little bit Pollyannish, as you know. So I, I've noticed. I personally believe <laughs> that because we have people on the Campus Village Board, like the Dean of the School of Nursing and Health uh, Careers, uh, Karen Miller, and we have lots of people from the Med Center coming to the I-70 corridor conference mm -hmm. that this is an agent, maybe the first agent possible to bring the Med Center and Lawrence campus close together on research interests. There have been long enmities here, disaffections, disassociations, as if they were in different universes, and we can't really succeed very well that way. And while it might be asking too much, I do believe that this is a possibility that if we, for example, if we have community-based nursing here as a part of it, and I know that Karen Miller is going to be working on it. And if we have a rehab satellite clinic, the OT, he, with OT and PT are going yeah, to okay. be here because they need placement sites. Yeah. I don't know if you know, but the first iteration of the Landon Center had an, an assisted living center attached to it. Yes, I worked on that. Oh, I didn't know the that. The site was really... Yeah. yeah it was, there were a lot of yeah, challenges. Yeah. Were you part of that too, right? We, we worked together. And, there were, and I went to a number of meetings uh, on that one a yeah. long time ago, yeah. and, and it imploded for a lot of, of reasons, right? Um, yep. Um, so. Well, I think one thing that you could do, because it's, it's kind of hard to tell what these uses are, but if there's a way to classify uses, is having uh, some impact, uh, direct impact on on residents that mm -hmm. would live here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, another use would be more of an office research based yeah. uh, uh, space that uh, mm -hmm. that could have subjects, but yet would not be uh, normally open. And then you can start to think about yeah. uh, the basic disposition of land uses here. It's it's actually pretty interesting because you've got really two major uh, streets on both mm -hmm. sides. You've got so this, bring people in this, this kind of big well. uh, connector here, mm -hmm. um, which sort of suggests that, that even if you did something that that had a cluster of uses mm -hmm. here that were all based on what you described, mm -hmm. and maybe something in this direction or in this direction that 
linked yeah. all of this together, yeah. and these were easy to get into and easy to get out of, so mm -hmm. you're not right. pushing right. people through the whole site. Right. Then a lot of this other could be thought of as as housing. Yes. Yes. Um, and the same over here. This is in fact fabulous up mm -hmm. here for housing because of the views and, and, and for multifamily housing what, too. What some sort of I what I would see would be some sort of pa pavilion he here that would house things like the 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 art the dance, the humanities outreach kind of program mm -hmm. that becomes a destination because it's flexible. It's multiple. You, you could use it. You could have special events down right. there. Mm -hmm. uh, you, the, the residence art gallery could be down there as well as the uh, uh, excess uh, things from the Spencer collection. One has to worry about security, but well, and you've the, got to worry about right. cars coming up. But but, the but you make it poor, porous some, right. somehow. And wouldn't that be lovely space? Mm -hmm. Overlooking the pond, which yeah. looks a little muddy at the moment, mm -hmm. where <laughs> that that becomes a multi-use uh, space for weddings and for uh, you know public events and that kind of thing, right? And we bring Ann Bastic back, and we put on a theater performance involving the residents. Although we have the community theater down the road, but you know, I really like this uh, circle. Uh, intersecting circle concept, I'm calling it that. Here's where I think is a very big challenge. This is the high point. This is where Pat Peary, I mean, at least the beginning idea is this is where he would have a signature building. That would be, I mean, originally that was sort of the old concept that you would agglomerate all your CCRC there, and maybe you'd put the university lab You surround there. the older adults and with asphalt. Something <laughs> like that. And this would be a tall building. Well, okay, density is great. I think that it could be a tall building there. And it might just be independent living or something. Mm -hmm. But I think that it makes sense because this is 6th Street. Coming right along here, this is 10th. And so this is a new gateway to Lawrence. This is down 6th Street, the next one's 15th. And I think that he is right that when people come by there, this has to be a striking building of some sort, and it is here, by the way, which we, I think, maybe got over this, is the university's brand will be put one way or another. Mm -hmm. I like just the walking KU. You've seen that one with the one foot out walking. Mm -hmm. It's not a foot, but I, it's, it's not the Jayhawk. It's not the rock job. Wait, do you want to join a Jayhawk on the roof? <laughs> uh, as, as John Gott said, no, no, no red and blue birds with uh, yellow uh, feet Socks. for us, uh, boots oh, for us. I thought we were putting one on the roof there. Uh, yes, I know. Yeah, that's what you wanted. You know, she's no, but a real. I, but man. I think this idea this of is a, having she, a couple of different alternatives. I mean, what what's kind of uh, uh, not so great about uh, an alternative? Like, I, I refuse to take my students to one project. Because if they lock in on one project, they think they know what it is. So I always try and take them to two things that are so different from one another that it totally confuses them. And they can't have a, oh, this is the solution. So I think it's true here, too. You need to have two or three different ways of thinking about the evolution of these uses and the kind of community that would result from it. And then you can start asking yourself the questions about how to tinker with both of them or how to create a third alternative or how to reinforce number one or number two in a way that seems to work a little bit more effectively and fits the developers um, uh, yeah. pro forma and, and their expectations for... We have to work with this developers. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm just wondering, you architects, you actually think there should be some tall building here that, you know, whatever, uh, there? I mean, is that any idea that would make any sense to you in terms of services socially? I mean, architecturally, you could do something, oh, but would yeah. it just be a pretense? Well, I, I don't know that I put it here. I think the highest uh, part on the site is actually over here because that's where the that's where the tower uh, water tower is. But but uh, if you if you figured out uh, and often putting something that's the tallest part and densest part of the building on the highest part of the site is you know is the solution that a lot of people choose because you're taking what is uh, a yeah, pretty uh, strong uh, component of the natural topography and you're and you're really just extruding it or extending it. And this is a great place, as David, the first thing you told me on the phone was, wow, this has got really good views. And I, I, I went over, parked here, and walked across the street and looked at it, and he's exactly right. It is a very compelling place. So to have a six-story building or an eight-story building, 
I mean, that's this, not. No, they're ready for They're ready for yeah. more density here. Yeah. Even the sustainability group said, look, we like this so much. It's way out there, but it's a new place. Can you please just make it more dense? Yeah. Don't spread it over like. Well, a, I think that's know. a good idea. I think that's a good idea. Well, this, this and they want open. visibility from Sixth yeah, Street. Yeah, but is the there. church going to spell that? Well, spell here's, here's the other thing. I don't know what they're going to do with that, mm -hmm. but this building right here is their new educational building. Mm -hmm. Supposedly mm -hmm. new. And they're hardly using it. The president of the Interest Bank is on our board, and he said, we have to do something with this building. And so the developer, Pat, and others have been talking about, we have to deal with spirituality here. We, we, you know, we are a democratic, secular, liberal county. We always go for the Democrats here. They kind of hate us for that reason <laughs> in Kansas. But we're going to have to deal with spirituality. And do we want to actually build a chapel here? I think a chapel, a big one, no. Maybe some little thing, yes. But I think here is the way in which we can use this and work with this church. And it doesn't have to be, this is a, call the church, Episcopal. Church of England, Dis Episcopal. So, you know, I don't like their hymns. I can't, they don't know how to sing. So we have to have something, an ecumenical thing here. Yeah. Well, and I, I think we can help them out by doing but that. But making the edges of this site a little bit more permeable is always a good idea. Yeah, and I think your, yeah, yeah. Your, yeah. you know, your big rock chalk um, yes. park, I mean, there should be a way to do this yes. too. Yes. And yes. encourage people and, to. And to get from this corner to this corner. Mm -hmm. Without getting get in there? your I've car and driving the periphery, right? That's right. I got a question. I'm going to claim I'm a student, so I can say ridiculous things that are completely retarded. Um, no, that's all right. I, <laughs> I say stupid things all the time. What if we approached this whole walkability connecting as a frisbee golf and having, instead of it actually, literally frisbee golf, but that's wherever you would put your landing, that's where you'd have the focus of a building or... Too much of the same thing, I would say. Well, but it, to, to create the paths, to, to figure out where those walking paths could be and how to to get... To so use it as an analogy yeah, to create the destination Exactly, the, how to yeah, get the paths in this paths organic kind of walking... Start nowhere and end yeah, nowhere yeah, yeah. and you need to have... Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, 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 they just, they just connect the, the asphalt. And they don't look public and yeah. what they found in the Briarwood development down the street here in Lawrence is they built a little mini seaside and they have these little public mm -hmm. thoroughfares and mm -hmm. the city gets all kinds of complaints for people trespassing through their property because it doesn't look public, it doesn't feel public, it's not tied to anything public, and it's caused the city a lot of grief, <laughs> interestingly. But if the number one step is to figure out the walkability, right. the, With you the take the, right, the yeah. organic... And, and what some of the literature talks about is perches, that is not just the little pocket parks, the kid park, the dog park, the whatever, but, but places to stop along the way. Right. Yeah, uh, so little pot, little little community gardens, pocket gardens, right? Right. Uh, it doesn't garden. really take much. Uh, uh, you need shade control, which is really yeah. important, whether that's a tree or a shelter of some sort. You need, we need a place wind, to sit. We need wind control out here. Well, there you go. So there's and another thing, and, and, and you need a place to sit, and whether that's purchase. one or two benches. I mean, it could be something that would fit in 120 square feet pretty easily, and serve the purpose of allowing somebody to recharge. Um, and maybe it's oriented in the view, or maybe it's oriented toward a butterfly garden or to some other kind of uh, on-site feature Mars. that would be of interest to somebody, a uh, you know, hummingbird. I guess the, the struggle I still bird have in, in moving in feeder. any of these directions is, you know, we always start with program, and projects are right. driven around what is the programmatic need, right. and it right. seems like there's a lot of, hey, we could do this, or we could do that, or we could do that. It's like we want to build the project and then come back in and program but it. I, I thought what was interesting was this idea that you could you could classify some of these uh, uses in certain ways that had, boy, just, this is just somebody's going to drive and work there all day so long. To me, it seems and like you want to clarify a lot of what yeah. you were talking about, Sue. And then there are and others I, I where you can validate whether you can get those ideas to work with the partners that are going yeah. to be required and, to make and them what, And some of the implications with regard to staffing and oversight. Yeah. But again, I think if we have some housing for students <coughs> that's low cost or no cost in exchange for some of the oversight, that's ex in exchange for some of the programming and assistance and that kind of thing, yeah. that could help. Work study um, Work study, you know, it's a, it's a 
Where live study. It's a live study kind of thing. Uh, I think that, w and there are a few developments like that. Purdue has been very successful in that regard. Um, it, but we also need some clarity as to whether there might be other kinds of units that people I would talk to, because I was really focusing on, I would, with the old gerontology in. But there may, as I was saying earlier, maybe there's some need that I don't understand to for more preschool uh, development in, in the University of Philadelphia preschool. Not, not just the Montessori, but the preschools in Hayworth on, on no. campus. And, and not only preschool, um, of course, you know, the but, superintendent of schools but, wants yes. to go to kindergarten. But, mm -hmm. but that means that the school district it, is here. So, so, uh, and preschool, there are infant and toddler centers and right. others are continuing there. Maybe there's some need and interest in relocating or expanding those. Do you have one? And we have four. Yeah. Four. Well, I was going to say most. We have infant and toddler uh, language acquisition. All, all, but all located in one place, or they're, they're clustered down by Hayworth and Dole yeah. on, on campus. We have, I think, um, six of them on in yes, different parts yes. of the. Of the but, but maybe, but there may be city. need to expand sure. uh, and and have them integrated with whatever the school board might be interested in, in doing. And again, that kind of intergener viewing it as intergenerational programming. To, because we will also need to address your problem. That is, what do the people who live in Nuvon House do all day, right? There's inadequate programming for older adults, particularly older adults with memory care. And the only models we have are playing bingo and uh, doing finger painting, right? There's not much else out there. No, that's, that's a struggle. It's, it is it's a, a real it's issue. Exactly right. And Some maybe, people don't want to. Do maybe, anything. but maybe they want we should take a yes, use this as an opportunity to get all of our curricula, all of our brilliant undergraduates involved in trying to figure out what to do for programming for older adults that's got to be better than bingo. Well, sometimes the best thing to do is just make places for them to watch so, other people. So that's that's where the art appreciation, the, the uh, uh, theater, the drama arts, um, exor integrated exercise programs could be very interesting in having memory care housing next to a, a collection uh, uh, of undergraduates Right, right now I have trouble getting them out, out and off campus. But if we have other things bringing them off campus, maybe we could get some movement on I that. Think, I think having some discussion, uh, apropos of what you said, David, about about programmatic components mm -hmm. that are possibilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, to do this, you'd probably want to talk with a, you know, a school of education to see if they have an interest in right. anything like this. And if they do, maybe there's a way in which that could fit into their broader uh, plan for expansion. Yeah. Who I, knows? There are yeah. lots of I, I, so I think yeah. we, uh, well, I, I think uh, it's true also because if those constituencies see a master plan that might come out of this process, Dennis, and it's got early childhood on it, they're like, well, what's that? And let's talk to us. Mm -hmm. The hospital's like, well, we are It seems like that really they're needs to be They're all on the board. <laughs> they're all on the campus. So has any board. of this been formalized, <laughs> the, the program? Well, the component parts of it have been started, and we've we've done quite a bit. And now it's our assignment to go back and to do, do more, more detail. Yeah. Not for the purposes the university thought they were going to do it for, but it must be done. And so that's part of the process right now. And the next six, eight weeks are going to be pivotal here, working with whoever's selected, and and working with the developer no, because I'm he has to make money here. David, right? what's your email? I, I'll send you what I have. Oh, that'd be great. Um, or give me Let's a card again because I've lost it in my <laughs> collection. That's is, there, is there a programming uh, component to the work that you guys have talked with them about? Or? I don't know if you've not, seen Not in depth. You haven't I seen mean, all the stuff that we have. No, we haven't. We haven't. And and that's why I feel it, like you know, we're be, way behind. Because John, our oh. architect here, what we did together and put together as components of the design thing, he looked at that, and I, of course, know something about programming. He said, well, I think that's pretty good. Now, how much more detail you have to have, I think, is a question. And it's a question that we have to ask the architects, because we are not going to do anything more than we need to do in this survey. Well, and my colleagues don't know space. They know equipment. Mm -hmm. they, 
but we're so used to making do with crappy space with that they don't know what space that's, that's, is. that's, that's, that's our job but, but, but um, you said they know also. needs and uses and what kind of equipment they want to put when sure. have to be in but, but we said but I'll send you what I also I think a really true on that is you can put a label on a name and without understanding how it's going to fit into the kind of broader right. vision for each of the schools or these other uh, groups that are kind of thinking about their own personal expansion and this is an opportunity. But I, but I see these as per, being part of what's attractive about this community because I keep pushing the idea of generativity. That is, older adults hit this sweet spot in life where they want to give back. And it's through volunteer activity, it's through being perfect grandparents, it's through other kinds of activities. And we should be capitalizing on this idea of generativity. I am a, I'm yep. almost on the verge of hitting that sweet spot myself, right? But that's who, who we want as residents. Yeah. And one way of giving back to the university, if you can't afford to write them a big check, you can participate in research. And people, <coughs> I have people crying to, for opportunity to participate in research because they see it's so valuable to participate in research, to train students, to work with students. They don't want to do my craft. They want to work with students. They want to help students get their degrees. They want, and it's that generativity ploy that we ought to be, that, that I think has real market value. Right? That people will pay to be provided with a context in which they can be generative. And that and actually the uh, that center that I showed yesterday yeah, yeah. in North Carolina yeah. is, that's it's, how they started. That's exact and I know those people. And yeah. I was very and heard them have that when they were having that discussion early on, right? It's the same they addressed it in one way, but I think we can address it in another way. Yeah, they, they, I mean, they started really with a bunch of volunteers yeah. on campus that yeah. were that were um, emeriti faculty yeah. and were were people who had chosen to live in um, in Asheville, and many of them were exactly and as they, you described. And they started people. out renting off campus space and realized that it would be more cost effective because of the NIH reimbursement policy to have their own space that they could then bill NIH for its its use. Yeah. Well, they had. Uh, Ron Manheiner yeah. was able yeah. to get the president of the university yeah. to commit yeah. to this building, and then they <laughs> and then they got funding for it. So uh, they and, and yes, and then the, then so, yeah. they made the other trick of getting it. Right. So it, Victor, yeah, one thing leads to another. Right? Victor, one quick question. Yep. This project started intergenerational. Uh huh. I don't I don't hear that being discussed at any at any level anymore, and I'm wondering if you know of. Yeah. Multiple generations no, living no, in clusters uh, could be designed into this, or should it be? I need some, I kind of some I or was it, or was it just a code word for senior living? I don't know. That's a good question. But I think if you look for ways in which you can satisfy the housing interests of a group of people, I, there are not too many projects that have been socially engineered with that set of uh, ideas or exchanges in mind, where, where you come in with the idea that you're going to help this person or that person. But if, if it's not, then it's like any apartment building in any sure. place, right? Yeah. And whoever moves in moves. Yeah. So what you need is a, a, a kind of, a, I don't know, a discussion about what, what the responsibilities and obligations are and what the possibilities are if you move into a setting like this. How can your life be enriched? And what can you get out of the deal that makes you feel better and more yeah. connected? And what can others benefit from you? That's the bottom line. Yeah. And I think that has a little to do with the, with yeah, they, the physical stuff. Right. It's more about kind of, that's what I was saying, that if you look at the descriptions that the co-housing people put together, it's more like a, here are 20 things that we want people who come in here or like to do recognize. Well, let's be happy. Kind yes, of yeah. yes.